Okay, hi. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, Microsoft Windows and its internals, and mainly related to one interesting module that can be reachable from very inter interesting sandboxes, as we'll see. At first, we can start introducing who we are. Uh, we are working for Tencent uh, at KimLab. Previously, it was known as KimTeam, um, but uh, this year was acquired by Tencent. So I'm now working at KimLab, and basically nothing can change for us. So what we're doing, it's uh, vulnerability hunting and exploit development. Uh, we, uh, vulnerab we hunt vulnerabilities and report them uh, directly to vendors, or go to competition where we develop the same exploit and show up. All, all the things to, for sake of security and improving uh, the state. And uh, we both with Daniel work in Windows research. And uh, we also said, we also said the competition at Pwn to and we're doing some various conferences or blogs or open source some code. Uh, as for my focus, it's uh, state object fuzzing. As for Daniel, it's data object fuzzing. And as for me, I, at the end, I put uh, the time Wushu player. Uh, actually, I do Chinese Wushu. And many people ask me if I'm good at fighting. The answer is no. But I do a lot of uh, squats and pro leaps to be good at running. That's my style. And uh, so we can start with presentation. At first, this is the agenda. And uh, we will talk uh, uh, from the beginning, let's say, uh, from the Base layer, that is, I think, most important layer is uh, sandbox. And we will, we will research, uh, we will uh, talk about how, to, how we can go from sandbox, uh, how we can bridge the sandbox uh, to get uh, to ring zero. And that can be uh, likely a little bit difficult because it's introduced a lot of uh, approaches how to defend against this one, this type of attacks. And naturally, we go to NTUS kernel, which is core of Windows kernel. And uh, we will see that there is not much, not much attack surface and not much to look for. It's uh, code is pretty limited, so what you can touch from sandbox. And uh, we go from, but it's unless uh, you can see a bit deeper and we see some extensions, how this code can be extended and uh, where you can look for more uh, vulnerabilities. And we end up at a uh, nice module, which is CLFS. Uh, and basically, on this module, uh, on behalf of this module, is the name of the title, this presentation, that note, because this uh, module is um, its purpose is for logging some interesting stuffs. And we go on for how to target this module, how to fuzz it, and it's about deep inter internals. Uh, so, as for sandbox, um, it's uh, as I said, it's I think, in my opinion, the most important layer of the security now because it's uh, really limit you a lot uh, from what you can target and even if you have a bug, uh, how you can use that bug. It's uh, basically do that you have uh, one application and that application can normally access any resource to get you some graphical outputs, to, to use any resource of the windows. But that, that was introduced sandboxes and different layers that uh, it divide this up this application to some entities. And these entities can so are responsible, every entity is responsible for, for something different. Parsing data, uh, um, parsing some graphic inputs and sending uh, some graphic outputs and all kinds of different stuffs that can be, can be separated to, to different entities. And that's it's just for sandbox. And every entity is then responsible for only a few things. That means you are really limited what you can attack. That's a really good thing. And uh, one how it's the sandbox done, it's by some nice rules, some nice mitigation introduced in operating systems. One of them is uh, every entity can have different uh, access rights. That means that, uh, for example, even if you have on Windows, for example, a core component, which is NTOS kernel, some graphs, graphics subsystem, which is Win 3 k and then you have dozens of uh, different uh, drivers with uh, good sandbox. You have nice rights that you, for example, you cannot touch any of the drivers except the core driver or graphic. And recently, it comes also for the graphics, some interesting rules that you'll filter out because graphic is uh, some huge component. And when you have a huge component, there is a huge potential for, for bugs and for exploitation. And they come with filtering and they basically could, could have uh, all the functionality so your application can just touch if it's filtered 
the some selected uh, APIs, which is really powerful because it cuts uh, some space, potential space for bugs. And the other side, when you even when you have a bug, and previously you can use, for example, one technique to rule over that bug, to rule of any bug, let's say, uh, to rule over some family of the bugs. But uh, with this, uh, for example, filtering, or with these uh, sandboxes, it can give you rules that even if you have this bug, you cannot exploit it because you can, from your entity, you cannot go, uh, you cannot use the APIs which can correctly manipulate with the state in the kernel. And uh, even better, uh, it's better. Let's say I, s I call this filtering like a doors. For example, you have doors and you cannot um, pa pass these doors because they're locked. Uh, so some, some, of the, some of the space is occupied and you cannot go through. But another way, you can go, because there is no wall, there is a, just doors. So you can go in different ways. So it's still doable, but it limits some attack surface, like for example this. But lockdown is simple, great wall, that uh, you cannot touch anything. But on the other side, uh, even through the gate wall, you need some auto pass. So you need to go somebody through that gate, and for that, you just need to go with that somebody to go through. And it was done also that it's uh, this year point to own how to break down even from this uh, environment. But let's say, let's assume that uh, we can touch only core components that is only NTUS kernel. And from that one, we have uh, some, some, uh, some, let's say this rights that even that uh, helps you, it helps protect uh, that, that part that even when you can touch this component, there are some checks that what you can touch and what you cannot inside the component. Because inside this uh, NTOS kernel, you have different objects, and uh, not to uh, to any uh, not to everything you can you can access. Uh, what you can access to is uh, fairly limited, and to core functionality to some basic types like mutex events, uh, memory uh, pipes, which pipe is really good, have sections, threads, and etc. But what I want to say, it's uh, even uh, you have these parts, it's not, I would say it's not huge attack surface. It's pretty, in comparison to graphics subsystem or these drivers, it's pretty small, let's say. And when you have small attack surface, it's really hard to find the bugs. Especially when these objects has um, only few Cisco, which can alter its, uh, that object state. It can be really difficult. And the same applies also for exploitation. But, uh, um, when you look uh, more further to this module, you can see some interesting uh, things. For example, uh, when, you, when you check the imports, uh, what's importing the core module of the kernel, you can see that uh, it is from TA module, and you can see some bunch of the, bunch of the imports. And more, inter more interestingly, uh, the, some of them have prefix NT, what mean that will be direct Cisco available through this uh, core system. That means that your application, even from some tougher sandbox, can go and call this uh, Cisco, and it can go through uh, this uh, Entos core system to that some under, under module, which is really nice. But so what is this module? Uh, this module outside PM. Uh, there's some pretty much words about this one, but I'm not going to read that uh, too much. But my thing, what's important, it's kernel transactions. And uh, so it means that, uh, what's from definition, it's that it's implemented in kernel mode. That's one good thing. And second thing is that uh, it's used from kernel and from user as well. So you can touch it from user mode and it's internally used also in kernel mode. That it means it's pretty much integrated into uh, core system itself. Uh, but when you, when you look more, more deep into this module, you see that it's not big module. Then it's, uh, let's say, simple module with uh, not much code, uh, with simple functionality. It's uh, basically, you can say that it have, <coughs> because nature of the transactions, we have the transaction of uh, only uh, small state, which you can compare to one on zero, and you can have safe state or restore state to the previous checkpoint. And it's not much at all. Uh, but on the other side, in this module, uh, you have four different objects, which is, the, uh, which is interestingly interconnected. And this one, you can do some mess. In fact, we, we did, and we, we got some results, which is one null-pointed reference, which is uh, only local DDoS, which doesn't count too much. 
also on Node4CV, but also we found unexploited vulnerability, which can be reachable from any sandbox, which was really good. And, but when you go more further through this uh, uh, module, as I said, that's either simple state here, one, zero, and safe restore, and some interconnections, but interesting is that safe and restore. Uh, and save and restore can be a bit more complex, but now I contradict myself a little bit because I said this uh, component, it's not much, mo not much functionality, it's really simple. That's true, but uh, when you look how it's, for example, done this kind of uh, backupping and restoring the state, you will see that it's called uh, some on the module behind the scene at the back end. And that's it, that this complex uh, mechanism of restoring a static state is done by different module which is CLFS, that's this module we're talking about. And this module is actually bigger. And uh, the purpose of this module is logging. That's why the dead node. Uh, it's common log file system, which is pretty good because commons means that it's fairly almost for anybody. And you can see that you can use it for user mode applications from kernel. You can see from example from this module that is uh, integrated in kernel itself. And uh, in deeper look, it's also at NTOS, that's, they use it also in NTOS. So when we look more deeper into this module, we can see that uh, it's uh, set is well integrated to some parts of the kernel, especially the TM. Uh, and they have C++ code base. That C++, uh, could, one interesting thing about C++, you can do it very good or very bad. Uh, in this case, I think it's more to very good. However, they, they I think, uh, focus too much at how to design it, which is nice, but they omit a lot of sanity checks, which is not so good. So, and another good feature of C++ is uh, by nature, it's more code involved. And then if more code, more place for some, doing some mistake. But, uh, is it possible to call it at from the toughest sandboxes? For example, when you are able to, as I said before, from some entities, you can just call NTOS, core system, but you cannot call, for example, that's different drivers, and we see that this different driver. But yes, you can. How to do it? Because as we said, that we have NTOS, it forward to TM, and TM is used internally. And for save and restore, they need to have uh, this module, and what they're doing, the they're loading this module, and this module is loading some, let's say, some file, which is then processed. It's open and parsed, and so later on can be uh, some some interacting, some add some things or delete. And that's pretty much of work inside the kernel. And data passing kernel, I think it's not pretty much good idea. And so when I realized this one, I think, okay, that's pretty nice. So let's let's do it first data passing because it's more is that most potential because data fuzzing, uh, for me, I personally really don't like data fuzzing because as in, in kernel, in user mode is okay, but in kernel, because the same thing you can do in user mode, process in user mode, and then just communicate some thin layer with kernel to get some information, or leave it almost at user mode and just communicate through some ITC. But they do it entirely in kernel mode. And that is sometimes a little bad, as we see also from the past, and also from here. Even if their code quality can be good, there can be mistakes, and this can be fatal. But I said, I'm not fan of it, and I'm really lazy for doing this uh, data parsing, because for data parsing, you need optionally to understand good data format, because otherwise it's um, a waste of time to fuzz it. But okay, that's, I see that, okay, this is the model in the kernel, I want to try it. But I'm, as I said, I'm lazy, I will do it really fast. So I just generate some file that was able to generate and grab some existing and start mutating and start feeding to the Cisco. But results was nothing. That for me was cool because I don't need to spend the time on this one and I can go on for original idea. An original idea was uh, state fuzzing. And that means you have some kernel object and you have some members and uh, some state and with different Cisco's you can alter the state and you can alter, alter until there will be some different behavior. But for this one, also need some work. Uh, first approach is uh, you need to take uh, that module, you reverse engineer it, and then try to understand what it's doing, how it's doing, how to interact with it. 
So basically, when you have third-party module, that's uh, the way how to do it is just call IOCTL, in fact. So for that one, okay, you find the IOCTL, which is pretty easy. But then you can see big switch, big uh, all the PCLs, which is good attack surface. But it also means that you need to reverse engineer a lot. And as I said, I'm lazy. So I want to do it for the easier way. Because when you do something at the beginning highly complicated, you most likely end with, okay, that's anyway the best time, and you go back to do it simple anyway. And so in simple, do it simple in this way means, okay, that at first I show you that's uh, what is this official description of the, this module. Okay, so go for it. We go to MSDN, we check the CLFS APIs, and we see, okay, it's a bunch of APIs. That's good. Uh, document it, which uh, this module is not, but this API is documented. We know what, to, what kind of parameters they, ex they expect. So, okay, we, we can try to implement, okay, we implement this, is, this API, and then, and then different APIs, are, and what kind of APIs we need to call before we can, we can call other APIs. That's all of them will be somehow successful. And we approach, okay, that we can trigger, okay, some good ratio, some successful hit for every API. We said, okay, that's fair enough. And now we can implement this logic to our internal fuzzer, which is pretty easy. And after that one, we can just want to, because we don't want to have uh, really obvious some patterns, how to call it. So we can just bit mess with the logic uh, to call, to get some house and get some good ratio of uh, doing some good things as doing some bad things. That means some successful ratio of the that API returns you, okay, it's successful or not, it was not, wasn't. So if you find good balance, that's a good way to go. And so we tried. I first, for my first run, I just run it. I uh, implemented my father. I will get in 15 minutes, I get first crash. And then I just run it from 10 machines and then started crashing one after another one. What's, what is this one? That was pretty unexpected and pretty fast. So, okay, I will check. But uh, then I check the first dump and I see, okay, this DDS only. Ah, that's a pretty sad story because for DDS only, local DDS only, you will not even get the CVE. So that's uh, cool, but for nothing, you're not so faint. So what's with this one? But okay, so let's get this dump and let's avoid this uh, happening, uh, avoid this triggering, this dump uh, in future fuzzing. So I did it and then run it again. Then after 15 minutes, it doesn't crash, so it's good. So I run it some bigger test and then the whites are uh, overnight and get some other crashes. These crashes was good. So finally, yes, and I do repeat this, also the SQL, okay, I get the root cost, for example, approximately root cost for this case. So I just keep this part and so let's run faster again. So I did this one and we got uh, about five, six, five, six crashes uh, in a few days. It was good. And uh, especially when you consider that I don't invest too much time for reverence engineering, for too much time for understanding, I just get uh, some lazy idea to quickly understand, uh, to quickly play and just implement it to faster. And after this one, I realized, okay, that uh, data fuzzing may be not that bad idea at all when you look at this way. So it has to be something done, what I've done bad in the previous step when I tried the first time to do data fuzzing. Okay, so I check back this module and check at the entry point and how would first get touched with my data. And I check it now, the magic point, they have some CRC. So that means that every time that they mutate the fuzzer, I just have back CRC, bad CRC and it's go to hell, N nothing will fuzz anymore. And also the other thing is after CRC, okay, this data look valid. So they try then update with this data, some relocate, some stuffs, and then those data are processed uh, to some other parts, which is our point of interest. So for that one, I need to implement, for example, the CRC, the specific CRC or this allocations. But for me, they mentioned only two times, and mentioned three times, I'm too lazy. And I want to do it really simple. And you see that is the code, and I don't want to understand this code because it really doesn't bother me what is this code. I will never use it in the future. And uh, it doesn't, I want to focus my brain on important stuff. So for this one, it's kernel code. It's, uh, for example, I can take it to IDA to just uh, some some code, but how it's Ida is doing it? They have the same code like I see here, and the code is basically data. 
So what I need to do with data, I will just load it and run it. But it's a problem. It's kernel code. But it is really a problem? Not much, because I said it's only data. So it doesn't matter if you run it to ring three on ring zero, except there are some APIs. But this, those APIs you can, in fact, emulate, which can be also uh, not so easy, but uh, you want to do um, this method only when, for example, it's uh, only some simple APIs that you can easily emulate. For example, X allocate pool, you exchange with malloc, or you can do some locking with some Zumi calls with nothing, which is easy. But in our case, it was even easier because nothing like this was there. So you can do it also in another way. You can do simple execution, but for this case, I think it's uh, overkill. But so do it simple. We just we load this module to memory. From this memory, we just restore some offsets. One and setting uh, protection to read, write, uh, and execute. And uh, we also pass the allocation, which I have, uh, which is just some one method, and I have implemented before. It's also just one call. And uh, one important thing that for CSC, we need table. And table was not resolved at the beginning. It's not statically resolved, but it's resolved at uh, runtime. So I just take from WinDBG and then again get the CSC table and manually then write it uh, at the runtime of my father. And what end up, ends up? Really good. We got uh, this kind of P of the bugs. Uh, one part of the state for, was from state fuzzing, and the other part is from data fuzzing. Uh, one part is from this dat dummy data fuzzing, where I did, okay, just fix these things, CS in the locations, and do some semi-meaningless, some randomization, some mutation, bit flips, and also some bit understanding of the header. And, and when I hit some bug, I just, okay, just analyze more of the header and avoid this bug, and do this kind of stuff. So that's, and I spent one and half big on this one, but then I was, okay, I will do it forever in this method. And I said, I'm not too fond of data fuzzing. But then it comes toward Daniel, and he did a really awesome job, and uh, a really good father for data fuzzing. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Peter. Um, after uh, so much introduction of the CLFS, do you know what is the so-called desk node? Uh, actually, it's just uh, the files that's supporting the CLFS. And you may uh, know that CLFS stands for Common Log File Systems and it is quite similar with NTFS. So uh, we can treat it like another file system. And uh, you know, uh, the job of file systems uh, is just uh, uh, act as the holder and the organizer of files, of data. And uh, so CLFS, uh, it, uh, it is much, much simpler than the NTFS. And it only has two kinds of files. One is called the base log file. It is only one file, and the others are container files. So the base log file uh, uh, contains the metadata uh, that is used for accessing the transactional data that is stored on the container files. And uh, okay, so uh, let me introduce the format uh, of, of the base log file. Now we can say that actually the base log file it uh, can be, it, it will be initially 64 kilobytes. And you can see the offsite, and it's uh, divided into six parts. Actually, it's three groups. Uh, each group contains a record, and the first group is control record, and then base log record, truncated record. Uh, you can see that each group, that's a primary record, that's a shadow record. So this is for, uh, you know, it, uh, it's for integrity. If the primary record is corrupt, and the shadow record will be used. Uh, so you can just treat them, uh, same. Treat them the same. And then we can see uh, the record header. Uh, this, this header is a common, is a shared common header of the three types of record. Actually, it's four types of record. I will talk this later. And we can see uh, this structure. I will highlight some points of these uh, members. So we can see uh, that, that uh, the number of sectors, the number of sectors and number of sectors copy, uh, they should be the same. And, and you can see that uh, the files here, actually in file systems, 
the granularity should be treated as sectors. So here is the number of sectors, and uh, you can mu multiply this with the sector size. You get the uh, total size of the record here. And then is the, the other one is the checksum. And checksum is just what Peter has mentioned uh, the, uh, that is related to the CRC algorithms. And uh, so each time uh, you want to uh, load uh, the CLF files, uh, you have to decode it. And then uh, is the uh, format version. Uh, this version must set, uh, set to zero if you're uh, do, doing it in the father because uh, if you call the encode yourself and it will be update, uh, it will be calculated and updated accordingly. And then is another very important uh, member. Actually, it's an array. Uh, we see the, the array is called record offset array. Uh, it contains 16 elements, but actually only the first element is important and commonly used. And you can use this offset to access the content data. Uh, and then is the fix, fix up array, fix up uh, offset. Uh, this is another mechanism that is to ensure the integrity uh, of those records. And then we can uh, see the control record, which is the uh, first record. And control record, uh, it contains some information uh, that about the layout of the base log file. Uh, it tells you uh, how to find the other types of uh, record. Uh, for example, here we have uh, some uh, very important information about the layout. For example, the actual records count, uh, which should be uh, normally six, and the array of the uh, record parameters. And then it's a, uh, uh, you can see some members prefixed with extend and truncate. Uh, extend and truncate, which will uh, also affect the size, uh, maybe let the base log file to grow. So, uh, they are all about the layout. Uh, then we move to the next record. It's uh, the base log record. This record is very important, and it is the most frequently uh, used record in the uh, base log file. And it has uh, two types of arrays. And the one array, one type of array is the uh, last two arrays. You can see that it's surrounded with a dashed line. And it's, uh, it is the direct offsite of the client contest and container contest. And you can also see uh, with the numbers uh, of the, uh, with the count of the array. For example, the container contest offset array, it has uh, the count of 0x400. So you can only have at most uh, 1,024 containers at most. And the other types of array are uh, just about, you can see that's three, uh, three rows, and they are, actually they are the hash table entries embedded. Uh, I'll talk, talk uh, to you this later. And why they uh, embed such uh, hash tables? Uh, you may know that hash table is very uh, fast for accessing elements, so that's why. And then it's a container record. A container record only appears in the container files. And all the uh, records before we introduced uh, are in the base log file. So uh, the granularity of the data that's stored in the container files is the container record. It means if you only uh, store one byte, uh, it uh, will uh, consume a complete uh, container record. And you can also see that container records share the same uh, common header with the uh, other types of record. So it is also protected by the uh, CRC, by the checksum. And if you do the fuzzing with this record, you also need to uh, take care about these things. And uh, another thing you can see there, uh, there's a LSN here is, stands for logical sector number. And uh, you can use this thing to uh, allocate or to find the data that you have stored to the container files. And uh, another thing is that uh, the, because uh, it, ha it can has many container files, and in normal case, it's two container files. 
So it is just stored like, uh, the, I mean, the underlying layout is uh, it's quite like the C++ DAC containers. Okay, and then is the uh, symbol header. And, and symbol header is uh, used for the hash tables. I've talked to you three hash tables. And those hash table offsites will uh, point directly to the symbol headers. And those symbol headers will follow uh, by the client context or container context. And you can see that the first member is the, uh, the magic. And this magic is quite similar with uh, the client and uh, container context. You can see that later. And this is the client context. And client context, uh, in normal case, only one client. Uh, but uh, for example, if we multi process, uh, they access, they want to save or access uh, transactional data to the same CLFS. Uh, it may uh, have several multiple client contests. And this is the so called multiplex uh, CLFS streams. Uh, such cases, uh, there's some examples, for example, the transactional file and transactional registries. There may be uh, more than one processes accessing them. So they are uh, the multiplex type. Then is the container context. Container context uh, is used for tracking the container uh, files. So uh, you can see that uh, you can find the container file size and actually as well as some uh, names, I mean just the path uh, pointing to the uh, container files. And here, uh, there's another thing uh, you, need to, you, you need to know that is the container file size. The multiple containers, they should have the same file size, but this file size can be configured. Uh, by default, it's uh, is 512 kilobits per file. Then this is how the, uh, Peter also mentioned that, that the CLF is written in C++. And we can see now uh, the class, this class is called CLF as base file persisted. And this file is used for loading the base log images and act as a buffer of such information. And first we can see that it will uh, read the information, load the information from disk, uh, from the base log file, um, the actual count and the uh, array of record parameters uh, we've talked about, they are stored in the control record. And after reading this, it, it will uh, use this information uh, to update an embedded array accordingly. And, and then if you want to uh, access a specified record, you will need to use such information. And th this is the uh, structure of the uh, parameter array element. Uh, you can see that uh, at offset zero, there's a buffer pointer. Actually, this buffer pointer is volatile. It means if it is in disk, it should be zero. And it will be only updated after you uh, load those uh, data to the uh, memory and then allocate buffers for each record and pointing uh, this, uh, this pointer to it. And the size and the offset, they are now volatile. They are persisted in the disk. And then is the, uh, the method we use to get the base log record. I've also mentioned to you that base log record is the most important and frequently used uh, uh, record. So uh, you can see that there is a dedicated uh, function for accessing it. And here you can see there are two offsides. One is, uh, uh, you can see two, uh, two, two similar, two same offsides. They are all 0x30, but they are different meanings. The first one is uh, pointing to uh, the array, and the second one is accessing the, uh, the, the, the third element in this array.
and this is uh, this is a method how we uh, load the record data from disk to memory. Uh, here we can see three steps. The first step is to uh, read sector, which will issue the uh, I/O request and do the actually physical reading. And after we read it, it will uh, the CLF driver will call the decode block uh, method to decode it. Uh, and this, fun this function just handle the checksum, the CRC stops. And after that, uh, the, uh, it will do some validation. If the record is valid, uh, it will uh, read, uh, return successfully. But if it's not, it will try to uh, read uh, the shadow record instead. And this is a use case of the acquire metadata block. And actually, there are, there are three use cases. And the, the first one is uh, after, after uh, the class passing, uh, lo loading the array count and the arrays, parameter arrays, it will first load the base log record, which is, the, which is the most important one, and then just keep it resident in memory. But for other records, for, for example, the control record and the truncated record, uh, so they're just not so important. They can be released. And if we, uh, they want to uh, be used again, they should be uh, called this method again. And here uh, is the part uh, that handles the uh, hash table. They load the hash table from disk to memory. And then this is the hash function. You can see that uh, this hash function only has one parameter, and this parameter is the path, is a complete path to the container files. Okay, so uh, now we have talked about enough details about the file format. How we use this? Uh, we talk so much, the base file format, control record, base log record, and symbol header, client compass, container context, and container record, uh, then we can start, we can fuzzing it. You know, uh, I've talked to you that CLF as driver has its own logic to pass these formats, but uh, is it well written? Is it robust enough? Uh, we will see that. So this is the uh, design of my father, the enhanced uh, father that is based on the format, the passing the format. Uh, there are six steps. So the first one is uh, select, select from a pool, and this pool uh, is uh, full of some innocent, innocent files, for example, the base log files as template. Then we will load uh, those files, deserialize them to, uh, to data structures in memory, and then we will um, do some mutation. After mutation, uh, we will do the uh, immune filtering mechanisms. And actually, this one is very important. I will talk this later. And then after mutating the, after, uh, after immune filtering, and then we will serialize the data structures back to files, and then put them back to the pools. Then we select another one, do this again. So this is a loop. Okay, this is some details of the codes how I implemented. So you can see that for uh, the control record, there's a class, and for the base log record, there's another corresponding class for that, and they share the same interface, and the interface is the serialize, the serialize, and mutate. So actually, it works in a from top to down style, it means uh, for a means like that, like this. So, for example, if you call this uh, deserialize method interface, it will call such interface on all of its data members. So here we can see the data members are the six basic records. And then we will do this recursively. For example, in uh, control record, uh, we can see that it has some offset arrays 
has some other very important information about extent and truncation. So it will do this recursively uh, to the leaf nodes. And the leaf nodes is, uh, the leaf nodes is some uh, data members that is the primary data members. For example, the integers, string, and binary block. Uh, if we are not familiar with some specific method, uh, specific field, we can just treat them as binary uh, block. And after some static analysis, analysis in, and uh, some fuzzing and debugging, uh, we can get much more knowledge about it. And then we know its type, and then we will uh, uh, replace it. Here is what I talked to you the, here is what I talked to you the uh, email filtering. Why it is very important? For example, it is file format, and there should be some field that is very sensitive. If you set some invalid values to this field, it may uh, immediately return with an error code. So it, this will block you from diving into the deep logic and finding some uh, you know, beautiful uh, uh, bugs that is very deep, hiding very deep. So I use this for, first for bypass such sensitive, uh, field, sensitive fields. Then I can provide a specific uh, class for doing, such, for doing such things. And uh, then we can only mutate uh, within the ac accepted state, accepted value range. And then here we can see that uh, there are some samples for such uh, email filters. Uh, the first one is a common error bypass. For example, this is just what I, t what I told that sensitive data members. And the others are POC, uh, POC replayers. So it means if we find some bugs and we know how to trigger that, and we know which part, which offset, or which member uh, we modify, it will trigger it. So we just uh, write a dedicated class for it. And uh, what we do is such thing. Uh, when we do the mutation, we first will uh, do the mutate from top to down way. And then after that, we will trigger the filter, filter on it. And you can see the trigger filter method, the, uh, the first parameter is three. So here, it just means that it will, it will trigger the POC three that we just registered above. And for other POCs, it just will bypass them and let them go. So here is the uh, code that implement this logic. And uh, okay, I think that's, uh, that's all. And uh, we ha I have not talked to you the results. Actually, uh, the bugs that Peter has found uh, in the legacy way, I have uh, regenerate and uh, uh, re regenerate most of them. And besides those bugs, I have uh, generated more bugs and uh, some, some of very good quality. And I have already reported three of them to the Microsoft. And still, uh, the Microsoft already verified and, but still waiting for release. And I guarantee to you, uh, those are uh, very good bugs and which will eventually lead, lead to the escalation of privilege that can be used for different kinds of things. Okay. 